intuition, your instinct, your senses, your call. In any procedure, having the right tools at your fingertips is something you'd never compromise. Olympus Medical allows you to focus on what you do best with a choice between the ultimate flexibility of the Olympus 3D platform or the premium resolution and color of the Olympus 4K platform. A simple choice that can transform your theater depending on your needs. Plug into the power of Olympus 3D, delivering unparalleled accuracy, precision, and flexibility, as this system is also compatible with an extensive range of surgical endoscopes. Olympus 3D is a new dimension with the feel and spatial awareness of open surgery and clinically proven performance. If you simply need premium resolution and color, immerse yourself in the Olympus 4K solution. It's big screen surgery that echoes the sensitivity and acuity of your natural eyesight for greater clarity. Dramatically broader color spectrum and natural immersion, giving you more information to make accurate clinical decisions. Together, the Olympus 3D and Olympus 4K platforms are the complete versatile solution for every hospital giving you confidence and vision without compromise. Olympus, your vision, our future. So, um, hello everybody. So welcome to uh, the fourth International Colorectal Disease Symposium. And um, it's our honor and privilege to, to have all of you with us tonight in Thailand, and I guess today in some other part of the world. And uh, Prof, uh, would you like to, to, to say something? Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> a pleasure to co-chair the event with you again. Um, I'm sorry that we're not in person and in Thailand. It would be a, a great pleasure for all of us to be uh, in this holiday season with you in Phuket or in Bangkok having this wonderful meeting. Uh, but thanks for letting us get to in a virtual sense and, and deliver the content to the world. Looking forward to a lot of interaction with uh, friends and colleagues from around the world, uh, experts in their respective uh, fields. And uh, without further ado, I think we can get started. If, if uh, you like, uh, I can introduce the first speaker and we can take it from there. Um, what we've tried to do is put together a series of talks for you that covers um, innovations and advances in colorectal surgery, um, really trying to tackle not any specific theme like inflammatory bowel disease or rectal cancer, but rather touching upon all the highlights uh, that have been under development during 2021 and, and uh, to some degree before. And, and so we have eight experts discussing eight of these topics. Uh, we'll have two panel sessions, one after the first four talks and the other after the three talks. So let's start out with something new and exciting and, and gaining more worldwide uh, acclaim, stem cells in, in colorectal surgery. And towards that end, Dr. Damian uh, Garcia Olmo from Spain has been invited to uh, share his reflections with us. So I'll turn the podium over to him. Thank you, Paul. Well, good afternoon and good morning in America. Well, first, uh, I would like to thank for inviting me. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And I would like to thank uh, to Professor R. Ian Yakas and also Professor Wessner for inviting me to speak uh, about uh, my preferred topics is the stem cell in colorectal surgery. This is the, my, my disclosure, mainly ligated to the relation of the pattern of stem cell for, for, for fistula and other and another use. Um, I would like to start speaking about the, the three big revolutions during the past two centuries. It was anesthesia, dyspepsia, mostasia. 
but uh, everybody say that uh, Sargon have a pending revolution. The pending revolution is the healing control. We can say that uh, probably all disaster or all problem in the post-operatory time is due to a uh, failure of the healing control. We can say that uh, probably leakage or uh, infection is uh, due to healing defect that, uh, that provoke due to inflammatory environment. And then healing is the core for a surgery. Um, healing is a cell passes process. And our idea in the beginning of uh, our experiment, we put a stem cell supplement in the critical area after, after surgery. Um, at that time, we, we, we know that uh, this kind of cells are potent anti-inflammatory due to immunosuppressive or uh, immunomodulatory effect. There is uh, a lot of data, a lot of paper speaking about this uh, mechanism of action of the mesenchymal stem cell. This is a classical schema of the healing that you, you, you can observe that after after a round or after surgery, in the first day coming to the area neutrophiles, later than four days coming macrophages, um, after 10 days coming uh, multinucleated. But if we use, uh, in this case, adipose derived stem cell, we can, we can see that a speeding of the uh, healing and also a clear improve because macrophages coming to the first day, a multinucleate multi appear in the area after four days. Well, with this uh, proposed mechanism of action, we can say that if we diminish the inflammation, we can increase and improve the healing. And the main question is from to go to the bench, uh, how to go to the bench to the bedside, to be exact, uh, how stem cell might help to, to colorectal surgery. This is, uh, to my knowledge, that there is uh, at least five clinical uh, scenario that when this uh, kind of cell has been proven. Um, the first of them is uh, the relationship between the use of stem cell and anastomosis. We have performed uh, a lot of experiment, but all of the experiment was in animal. The, the idea was to use shooter as a carrier to transport the cell at the critical area of the anastomosis. And we coded shooter using uh, mesenchymal stem cell. With this uh, uh, mechanism, we, we perform different kind of anastomosis in an animal model. Um, we can observe that uh, the bursting pressure measure and other uh, measure uh, related with the resistance and the, and the quality of the anastomosis that when we use, when we use a stem cell, we, we, we can achieve better resistance and also low adhesion. And then the question is, uh, there is all other studies, yes, there is other studies alone around the world, but all the studies are preclinical studies. And there is not a clear uh, translation of the, of the, uh, from the lab to the, to the bedside, because cells in regulatory issue are a real drug, a real medicine. And then to go to the bench, to the bedside using pseudo with cell, is uh, a big problem from the, regul the regulatory uh, point of view. And then to, 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 to do a conclusion of the relationship between stem cell and anastomosis, we can say that the stem cell clearly in the lab improve healing of the colon anastomosis, but there is not today currently lab, uh, there is not a randomized clinical trial. Nevertheless, we are now, recently, we have a patent in progress with Takeda, and now we are preparing or design a new clinical trial in order to translate this knowledge, this knowledge to the real clinical practice. Uh, 
The second aspect, the second issue of the use of stem cell therapy is fecal incontinence. There is a lot of review and a lot of experiment speaking about the possibilities of stem cell therapy to improve uh, incontinence. There is a lot of experiment in animal model in the lab, and also there is a few clinical trials. The majority of the clinical trial meet with the, the paper from Professor de la Portilla that say that this procedure is feasible and safe, but all of the current clinical trial fail to demonstrate efficacy, real efficacy in this, uh, in this uh, condition. And then we can say that there is a safety, safety is warranted, but uh, encoding results from, from lab, but currently we need better, we need better uh, clinical trial in order to observe if this knowledge from the lab can translate to the clinical, uh, to the, uh, clinical set. Now we are involved in an, a European study uh, using muscle cell and um, probably we can design a new clinical trial in this line. Well, uh, in relation with anal fissure, to my knowledge, there is only a prospective uh, trial only involving six uh, patients, good result. And similar is in the, the use of stem cell to treat pilon uh, pilonidal sinus disease. Only a one prospective inter interventional pilot study with uh, only seven patients. And, and the main question for fissure um, pilonidal uh, sinus is why, why use this sophisticated technology if we, we have better method to resolve? And then there is, a, there is not a good relation for, for the use of that. And the star for the use of stem cell probably is in, in fistula. In fistula, we agree debate in different media including uh, Twitter as you can, and you can observe. And um, the main question in this area is why using a stem cell to treat fistula? Um, the answer to this question is very easy because uh, the fistula remain as a real dilemma. This is a real and meet medical need because uh, the, the, the recurring of the incontinence is uh, very frequent after of classical surgery. Specifically, to, to be exact, in the, in the treatment of complex perianal fistula in the case of patients who had Crohn's disease, because I'm perfect standard of care, of care using medicine and using surgery, only achieved 37% of good closure of the fistula after 10 years of follow-up. It's a real problem. And the, the algorithm to treat fistula uh, introduce uh, surgery, but uh, big surgery that is uh, a problem for this case. It's so difficult to perform flash or leave in this uh, scenario. Um, result using this, uh, this uh, algorithm is uh, in some way a disaster because it the, the have a devastating impact on the patient and also up to 40% became incontinent. We, we, we need new perspective. Also, we need to improve the patient report outcome because fistula, specifically in the case of Crohn disease, is a disaster in relation with the patient quality, quality of life. We start with this study in 2002. This is our pipeline, our roadmap. Um, we can observe that we perform from the proof of concept, phase two, phase, phase one, phase two, phase three. And first we use autologous use, later we use uh, uh, allogenic use uh, in the future probably. And in 2018, we, uh, we get to the European marker and the last week we get to the Japan marker. And now, uh, for, for us, the more, the more important is to design robust clinical trial uh, in order to study, and the more difficult to, to define is the phase three clinical trial in order to final confirmation of safety and efficacy. Probably the pivotal study, the more important of uh, our study is the 
European and My CD. The European and My CD was conducted in 52 center in H control. Um, it's a very simple design with only two R, the treatment R and the, and the placebo R, but the, probably the, 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 the key question is that we use minimal aggressive surgery two times. Um, we developed our concept of the use of minimal invasive surgery in the, in the fistula. In this case, the minimal invasive surgery is only a vigorous coverage and only the closure of the internal of the internal opening. With this um, simple maneuver, we achieve a statistical result in the week 24 and also better statistical result in the week 52. This is very important because we are speaking of the living medicine. We observe better results in later, in long term than in short term. And a paper that will be published uh, uh, approximately, uh, we can observe similar results. After two years of follow-up of this patient, we can observe that result remain, and we can speak about we are using a real living drug, a real living medicine. This is very important because if we compare with uh, medical treatment, we can observe that the medical tre treatment decreased the effect alone of the one year. But when we use only simple injection, simple jabs of a cell, we can observe an increase of the effect. And this is in relation with the idea that we are working with living medicine. Um, this result appear in the, in the environment of the excellent safety profile. And what mean in real clinical term was that patients have less incontinent, less adverse even, and also we can perform a new injection if we have problem with the first injection. The result goes to uh, the guideline, the guideline are changing, guideline are changing in Spain, in three point, and also in, in the European in eco, eco guideline. Eco guideline now so that the, the only uh, action that have uh, that uh, get to the evidence level two is the use of allogenic adipose derived stem cell. And now we have a uh, real drug named Alovisel in order to use in patients who had Crohn's disease with fistula. Um, recently, we, we have received data from real world practice and the early paper saw near to 70% of healing after one year of one injection. Um, we, we, we need to think uh, this is a, a revolution because we, we are changing the, the, the we, are, we need to change to change the, the, the algorithm of the treatment of the of the fistula in patients who have Crohn's disease and we can use minimal aggressive surgery supported by cell no aggressive surgery and we can avoid in all cases the 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 became of patient with uh, incontinence and then uh, look into the future we can with the future we can pens we, we can think that we are entering in a new era of the treatment because we we can to treat the big problem of the surgeon that is the control of the healing and then probably we will enter in, in the era of biosurgery um, from my for all my team thank you very much for your attention thank you thank you very much uh, Professor uh, Garcia del Olmo, uh, for your excellent presentations, and they the, they'll keep Q and A to to the end of the session uh, for the four talk for first four talks, and the, the next talk would be um, wait and watch protocol, very interesting for rectal cancer, and the talk would be delivered by Professor Rodrigo Perez. Hey everyone. First of all, thank you for the kind invitation to present here. It's a real pleasure to be with you, with you here today. Pity we cannot be in person and in, in, in beautiful Thailand. 
So I'm going to talk about new adjuvant therapy for rectal cancer in the setting of organ preservation and watch and wait. Um, these are my disclosures. Now, I want to challenge you that until now, most of the cases of organ preservation has been or have been in, in the setting of an accidental watch and wait. Now, the reason is most of these patients had high risk features and underwent chemo radiation therapy for oncological reasons. And by chance, by accident, by luck, they achieved a complete clinical response. Now, this is probably old now, and we probably have to think about organ preservation at the time of MR staging of these patients. We ought to ask ourselves whether this patient is a candidate or is there, is there any interest in organ preservation in each and single case we consider for new adjuvant therapy? And central to this is really high resolution MRI, and not simply pelvic MRI, but dedicated high resolution MRI for the selection of these patients. Now, concept number one, we would only consider patients for organ preservation whenever the tumor is located at the level of or below the anal rectal ring, as, as you can see in this dotted red line. Um, we believe that this is the case for two reasons. Reason number one, patients who have tumors located at the level of the anal rectal ring or below it probably benefit the most from avoiding TME surgery, as opposed to patients with cancers above the anal rectal ring where the benefit is not so great and you begin to uh, be outweighed by the risks of watching it. So we really think that the benefits outweighs the risk among patients with tumors located at the level of the anal rectal ring or below it. Now, the second reason is that we have a very useful tool to assess tumor response, which is digital rectal examination. So th this is very important that only patients with tumors at the level of the anal rectal ring and below it are accessible to digital rectal examination. And therefore, we believe for these two reasons are the best candidates for organ preservation strategies. Now, the, 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 the condition for these patients to be enrolled in organ preservation strategies has to be the achievement of a complete clinical response. And complete clinical response is defined by three pillars. Pillar number one is digital rectal examination. Pillar number two is endoscopic assessment showing a white scar, no ulceration, no stenosis, no irregularity. And pillar number three is uh, high resolution MR. Used to be any radiological imaging study, but now high resolution MRI has been so well studied. And whenever we see a low signal intensity area on T2 sequences like this, you're pretty much safe that this is a complete clinical response and it should be used as one of the criteria. Now, there is no perfect test. There, there has to be a combination of studies to identify properly patients who have achieved a complete clinical response. And then this is an interesting study from, from a, a radiological group. Uh, Regina Beach Stan has been studied this for a long time. And as you can see here, the rock curves, they're not perfect. But as you can clearly see, the best rock curve is provided by clinical assessment. So don't start replacing clinical assessment by MR imaging. MR imaging is important, but it should, be, it should not be the sole tool in the assessment of tumor response. Now, there are many ways of treating rectal cancer. And it used to be that patients were treated by regular chemo radiation therapy. But now we have TNT, total new adjuvant therapy. Now, total new adjuvant therapy is the concept of offering adjuvant chemotherapy instead of after treatment, before either surgery or watch and wait. So we're really delivering chemotherapy up front together with radiation therapy. Now, either before 
or after, and, and it's called induction when we deliver before radiation therapy and consolidation when we deliver it after radiation therapy. Now, the two basic aims of total new adjuvant therapy is to improve survival and improve response. Now, if you think about it, there are basically two components of TNT, radiation and chemotherapy. Now, chemotherapy is the only one who really improves survival. Radiation therapy does not improve survival. Chemotherapy does improve response, or at least we think it does improve response, and radiation definitely improves response. So in, in my opinion, one of the very few reasons to really use both components of TNT together as, as they are usually reported is actually organ preservation. So if we want response to the level of the achievement of a complete clinical response, I strongly believe that TNT should be used and both components, both components of TNT are very much justified in this setting. Now, what should we use? There are so many TNT regimens being reported recently. Well, it doesn't really matter when you achieve a complete clinical response, such as here, it doesn't really matter what kind of treatment I used. However, if you're thinking about uh, prior to treatment and you want to offer your patient the best chances of achieving organ preservation, I still believe there is data to suggest that the best chances of achieving a complete clinical response is by using long course chemo radiation therapy and consolidation chemotherapy. As suggested by the OPRA trial, as you can see here, patients who were treated with long course chemo radiation therapy followed by consolidation chemotherapy achieved nearly 50 or 60% complete clinical response and complete clinical response was the actual um, um, clinical endpoint used in that study. This is pretty much the same as we achieved with our own regimen using long course chemo radiation therapy followed also by consolidation chemotherapy. The difference here is we are only using only five of you in the consolidation uh, treatment as opposed to the combination of five of you and oxaliplatin uh, used in the OPRA study. So pretty much we're looking at a 50% chance of achieving a complete clinical response if we treat our patients with long course chemo radiation therapy and consolidation chemotherapy. Now, once we achieve a complete clinical response, we usually enroll these patients in a very strict um, follow-up program. And, and, and the, this follow-up program is very much strict during the first three years after the achievement of a complete clinical response. What we are scared of is the development of a local regrowth. Now, local regrowths are quite significant. Um, in, 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 in these two studies, which are the two most robust series of patients with complete clinical response, you can see that about one-fourth of patients will eventually develop a local regrowth after the achievement of a complete clinical response. Now, there are some good news about local regrowths. Good news number one is the fact that nearly 90% of the local regrowths will have some kind of endoluminal component. Now, this is important because it means that the finger and the endoscopy will be able to detect 90% of those local regrowths. Now, a 10% of the local regrowths will have an exclusively mesorect component. So it, it is important to follow up these patients with, with some, kind of, some kind of radiological imaging. And we strongly suggest that high resolution MRI is currently the best way of following up these patients. And the reason is 10% will have exclusively mesorectal component of the, of the local recall. Another good news is the fact that the majority of these patients have salvageable disease at the time of local regrowth. So we're usually 
able to salvage these patients. In addition to that, we usually end up doing the same operation we plan to do in the beginning. So if the patient was a candidate for a sphincter preservation operation at the time of local regrowth, we usually can do the same sphincter preservation uh, or preserving operation at the time of local regrowth. As a matter of fact, a number of these patients, we were able to detect the local regrowths at a very early stage. And we are, were actually able to perform a local excision in a number of these patients. Now, when we retrospectively reviewed those patients that were managed by local excision and successfully managed by local excision, you can see that the majority of these patients were actually early stage at baseline. So the patients who develop local regrowth that are amenable to a local excision were more likely to be early stage at the beginning of treatment. Those patients had a second opportunity for a organ preservation strategy at the time um, of local regrowth. Now, one of the Achilles heels of, 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 of watch and wait is still the development of a metastatic disease. And, and you have to understand uh, um, very uh, carefully here what, what's going on. So if we compare patients who achieve a complete clinical response to patients who were operated on with a complete pathological response, there are really no difference, differences in terms of the incidence of metastatic disease between those two big groups of patients. Now, if we break up the complete clinical response group into those who have achieved a complete clinical response and never developed local regrowth, and those who achieved a complete clinical response, but then eventually did develop a local regrowth. And you can see clearly here that patients that did develop a local regrowth are indeed at higher risk for the development of metastatic disease. So at the time of local regrowth during salvage, we have to understand and acknowledge that these patients seem to be at high risk for development of metastatic disease. This is, it, 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 it is actually intuitive because patients who develop local regrowth are really those patients that weren't a complete clinical response. They were apparent complete clinical responses. So they are intrinsically different than those who achieve a complete clinical response and never develop a, a local regrowth. But really, it, it calls the attention the patients, the subset of patients who have a complete clinical response and eventually do develop a local regrowth are at higher risk for development of metastatic disease. So in summary, we now have clear and objective criteria of what a complete clinical response is. And it's basically on, based on three pillars. Don't forget that the digital rectal examination is crucial here. And it means that only patients at the level of the anal rectal ring or below uh, harboring tumors at that and that level are actually candidates for um, a watch and wait strategy. Remember, surgery is particularly terrible for those patients, uh, either because you need an AP or you need an intersphincteric resection. We usually don't uh, use excision or biopsies for the purpose of, 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 of diagnosing a complete response. Patients are very well, uh, uh, very much um, uh, fine with the, with the clinical assessment alone. There is no need for excision or biopsies here. Yes, follow-up is critical, particularly during the first three years of follow-up. This is where the most local regrowth develop. So it is, it is pretty intensive. And, and if you do so, you will be able to detect local regrowths uh, at early stages, and sometimes even uh, providing these patients the chance of, of, of undergoing another uh, organ preserving strategy, such as a local excision. Apparently, there are no differences in, in systemic relapses when the entirety of the groups are compared. Remember, there's a subset of patients who have achieved a complete response and go on to develop a local regrowth. These patients are particularly 
at risk for development of metastatic disease. Definitely use of TNT if your aim is organ preservation. If this patient has an interest in organ preservation, definitely consider uh, uh, the opportunity for TNT. And if that's the case, long course chemo radiation therapy and consolidation chemotherapy. Finally, you don't have to do watch and wait. If you don't want to do watch and wait, it's fine. Don't forget to inform your patient that watch and wait is an option, even though you are not comfortable with doing it. Uh, I hope you you appreciated this this um, this uh, subject, and I'll be happy to take any questions during this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that's an outstanding uh, presentation and, and work. Congratulations to Professor Hall uh, at the. Cleveland Clinic main campus, past president of the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, uh, and uh, uh, past member of our donors at uh, Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Tracy's going to talk to us today about a, a very important topic, and it's the multidisciplinary team approach, which I think many of us think of in terms of, of cancer, but I, I suspect that Professor Hall is going to enlighten us some other uses of the MDT. Welcome, Dr. Hall. Um, well, good day. It depends on where you're at. Um, obviously, it's morning um, where I'm at, but good day to everybody. Thank you very much for this invitation. Um, it's so nice to see people on the screen. As um, others have voiced, it would be so much nicer if we were all there in person, but um, it's really nice to see people on the screen that I haven't seen in, in quite a while. So um, as you heard, I'm tasked with talking about um, improving outcomes with multidisciplinary care, and I have no disclosures. So the first thing I think we have to um, think about is, is what are we really talking about? We're talking about meetings or case conferences where we're going to discuss new patients on a regular formatted basis. It isn't like helter skelter here and there. We're going to do it on a regular basis. And then who is going to come to this conference? It's going to be groups of specialists with expertise in the relevant clinical management of the disease we're talking about. And as, as Dr. Wexner pointed out, we usually think about this as cancer, but I'm going to talk about it um, for pelvic floor disorders and inflammatory bowel disease also. So whenever we're thinking about adding a new, a new dimension to our care, we have to be very conscious of our limited time and the money that it's going to uh, involve. And it may not directly involve an output of money that we have to put out, but from lost ability to see patients and other things, there's, there's definitely revenue that is lost. And I thought this was an interesting study. In 2010, in the UK, they estimated there were 1,500 um, colorectal cancer multidisciplinary team meetings. And it cost 100 million pounds, which is $103 million in US. So if you look at this strictly from lost revenue from the ability to see patients, it's pretty costly. So we better make sure it's worth it. And I also um, wanted to look at this from other, other aspects. So there's all kinds of um, science that we may not know anything about. This is complexity science that looks into um, team dynamics and interactions. And I thought this was, they talked about it with palliative medicine, but it really pertains to us. So what, what these meetings do is they set up this adaptive system for these complex problems. And they um, are diverse people that are involved. And we all know that we're interacting um, regularly, for instance, with rectal cancer, with oncologists and hep uh, hepatic surgeons and radiation therapy and nutrition, et cetera. And it allows the control to be dist distributed or shared versus where the surgeon was always the one in charge before. Um, and they even mentioned this in the palliative care. So there's a, there's a lot of science behind this. And this is basically, for anybody that's taken any leadership courses recently, it's team dynamics and it's the epitome of team dynamics. This was quite interesting. So in 2013, they studied virtual multidisciplinary teams. They had no idea what was gonna hit the world. And they did a lot of investigative look and they said, you know, 
there's so many problems with these technical, uh, so many technical problems with these virtual meetings. And the people are socially loafing. They turn their screen off like many of you are probably doing and not paying attention to what the speaker is saying. And all these issues that we face, and they thought it would be a nice niche concept, but they thought it would never catch on. Boy, were they wrong. All we needed was a good pandemic to push us into making this work. All right, so let's go to very specific diseases. The first we're gonna talk about is colorectal cancer, which everybody is usually pretty familiar with. So the, the, actually the concept was introduced in the UK in the 1990s, but I have to admit, I was a surgery resident in the 1980s and we had a tumor board where I did my surgery residency. Now, it wasn't for patient management, it was for education of the residents and the medical students, but I don't think the concept was really fully introduced um, in the UK. I think there was other kind of floating around concepts before that. It was based on this report that was published in 1995, the Kalman Hine. And, and what, what the concept is for this is that all patients with cancer should receive equal access to high and uniform standard of care treatment. And when they studied it, um, they found that that wasn't occurring. So at uh, the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, we uh, were going to jump into this full throttle. And obviously there was a lot of speculation. There always is whenever you're gonna do something different. And we're, especially if you're dealing with surgeons who are usually somewhat resistant to change. So for a year, we filled out a questionnaire uh, after the multidisciplinary tumor board conference. And it was uh, pretty explicit. I filled out multiple. We had 371 patients and this was our result. We found out 26% of the time that we changed what um, we were going to do with the patient. We found out that if we were not exactly sure ahead of time, if we have tentative plans, it changed almost 50% of the time. I thought this was the most interesting. Interpretation of the imaging uh, was changed 50% of the time. So when we all got together and we had a specially um, advanced trained person that was with us for rectal cancer uh, that from the radiology department, 50% of the time, um, the interpretation of the imaging train changed, 21% for pathology. And it didn't matter where you were in your career, if you're early, mid or late, about a quarter of all of us uh, changed our plans um, and so having a lot of experience didn't, um, didn't, didn't make it that you didn't get anything from the conference. So, okay, we may change our plans. Does it really help with uh, survival? This study looked at 586 patients over a year and they compared the 411 that were presented at the tumor board to the 586 that were, uh, total. And when they looked at all survivors, patients presented at the tumor board, which is the uh, graph on the left, uh, significantly had improved survival. Um, if they divided it out into early stage and advanced stage, they found that the early stage, it really didn't matter. So if patients were early, uh, early cancer patients that whatever decision was made by the individual surgeon was probably okay. But the advanced stage definitely, um, probably for many reasons of adding uh, standardized chemo and radiation, et cetera, et cetera, they had significantly better survival. So tumor, uh, multi-tumor disciplinary conference benefited those patients. This was a systematic review and they picked out many different studies um, from GI malignancies. And I'm just gonna highlight a few. So this study from China showed that um, patients presented at a multidisciplinary team conference had a significantly improved five-year survival from um, improved from 62% to 79%, which was significant. Um, this study uh, showed that we could improve surgery so you might say, how would you improve surgery? And um, what they found was the circumferential resection margin 
was um, significantly less involved in patients that were discussed at multidisciplinary uh, tumor board. And so after chairing the NAPRC accreditation committee in the United States now for four years, I can tell you my thoughts about this. Um, these are surgeons, if you're gonna present your patient at a tumor board and you're not required to, these are surgeons that are interested and wanna improve and probably have um, a lot more training nuances in how to dissect in the pelvis. And I can tell you at NAPRC, we show the circumferential resection margin or your degree of uh, doing a total TME. We show the pictures at the post uh, surgical evaluation. And none of us surgeons want to be the ones where they say, oh, this is not the best grade of tumor resection. So that peer pressure does work. And then the last study here um, was similar to the study that I showed from the Cleveland Clinic. It showed 23% change in management from multidisciplinary team. So in summary, this, uh, this publication, which uh, Dr. Perez and Dr. Wexner were part of, uh, that was in Nature Reviews, kind of sums up in cancer, colorectal cancer, that the MDT does improve all aspects of the care. It provides algorithms that help people and guide them. It makes us review the, the x-rays, standardized way of uh, performing the x-rays in a standardized review. And it improves our surgical care. Like I said, the post-op review of that specimen, uh, it causes great peer pressure. Okay, what about the pelvic floor? Let's change gears. So this was from Rush in Chicago where they looked at um, almost a year of a patients, 100. And I think that one thing you have to think about is who do you need on your teams? So for this, they had a behavioral specialist, uh, which you typically would not have. You might have psychological support on an MDT for colorectal cancer. A little bit different than anybody that deals with pelvic floor patients knows we need a little bit different type of uh, behavioral support. And they said it was very hard to measure and aim or measure improvement. But what they did come up with was that they felt that it really reduced fragmented and incomplete care. This is another study. And this was um, kind of a really good um, overall look at, at the cost of a multidisciplinary team for pelvic floor. And these authors felt, as um, I think most people would agree, there's a lot of pressure, um, peer pressure outside of institutions that every patient that's very complex should be presented in a team setting. And so they felt a lot of pressure. So over a year, they looked at 152 patients. In 20%, it did change their management. And similar to the study from Rush in Chicago, they felt there was more holistic evaluation and it could lead to change for the very complex patients. So for pelvic floor, we have different team members. And I think the we have had multidisciplinary team approach to pelvic floor at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio and, and in Florida for a long time. And I think what it does is it makes you look at the pelvis as the entire organ, not just the posterior pelvis. Because you do something in the posterior pelvis and it's like domino effect, the mid pelvis and the anterior pelvis then uh, decompensate. There's less fragmented care and it should lead to combined surgical intervention. So these patients shouldn't be getting a rectal prolapse repair from the colorectal surgeon and then a later date, um, a mid compartment repair like a sacral copalpexy. So lastly, I wanna look at inflammatory bowel disease. And this came from the British Society of GI and the consensus guidelines. And um, basically, as you would imagine, they looked at the gastroenterologist, the colorectal surgeon, the IBD nurse specialist, the radiologist, dietitian, and a coordinator. <clears throat> and then they also had other people that were involved. Sometimes you'd need an obstetrician, a rheumatologist, a hepatologist, dermatologist, et cetera. And they um, wholeheartedly recommended that all the patients be presented, but I thought it was interesting. It was strongly rec recommended by everybody, but had very low grade of evidence. So is there evidence that shows that um, one-stop shopping is better for complex IBD care? 
Um, this group looked at it and they felt that the areas where there was um, really a lot of improvement in the care was obstetrical care, how to guide obstetricians in caring for IBD patients when they become pregnant, um, nutritional services, particularly in patients that were having trouble, psycho psychosocial support. Um, they question whether the patient-centered medical home may be a better choice than the, uh, the every patient be uh, presented at an, IB, um, an MDT team meeting. And they wondered about all patients and the financial sustainability, which is um, a very, very uh, big concern. This was a different study and they looked at prospectively three years of multidisciplinary team and they focused on the medications and they compared 81 patients managed by the team with defined algorithms and plans versus historical controls that had not been managed by a team. And this was basically drugs, drug monitoring, change in drugs. And they found that there was improved efficacy and safety in the drugs, reduced hospitalizations, reduced surgery, and reduced incidence of serious infusion reactions. And I think perhaps this is, this is one of the ways that when I look at patients that we present at our MDT meet, meeting that come from outside, I think this is one of the ways we can really improve care because there's not specific algorithms like we've, we've made for rectal cancer. And I think that the, the medication optimization and how it should be done and whether you look for antibodies and drug levels, this is all over the place, not just in the United States. And I think we can do a better job. I do think the IBD home may be a better concept. The IBD home has uh, within its um, imaginary walls, the nutritionist, the psychologist, um, the surgeons are in it, the GI doctors, um, there's people for financial assistance. And it's more, um, more of a team approach that we use that is not as, um, as formal as having them presented in a team meeting. I think they do deserve to be presented in a team meeting, but they're so long-term and so complex. I think that a team meeting is not financially um, stable, is not financially feasible over time. So I think the IBD home may be a better concept. I do think what this does though, is it leads to better communications with the surgeon and the, the IBD doctor, which in many cases is really crucial because I think that we all have to have input in, into these decisions. So this is my last slide, thinking things through. I think that the team benefits patients, but we have to balance a lot of things here. We have to balance the financial commitment, the time commitment. Our time is, is so precious now. And um, I think we have to really think this through. What it does, what I really like that it does is it helps um, in team dynamics and it's been shown to help uh, decrease burnout. And I think it gets us more in tune with our team members our medical colleagues, our nutritional colleagues, et cetera. And I think Zoom technology has forced us by COVID to have these Zoom meetings, which I think are more financially and time feasible at time overall. I think we've gotten much better at the technology. And I think when COVID hopefully is over at some point in our futures that we were at least under control um, we'll be able to use the Zoom technology to continue to really um, hone in on patients. And the other thing that it can do is it can allow us to be able to have meetings that include more than just our nucleus at our hospitals. There are um, plans underway in the United States that people present rectal cancer, for instance, at a, at a multidisciplinary team meeting where part of the team, especially in a state like Wyoming, is all over, all over the state. So it allow us to have better care for patients in particularly rural areas. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, I hope everybody stays safe. Yeah, thank you, Professor Hall. Thank you, thank you uh, for the excellent uh, talk as always. So um, we're gonna go back to Professor uh, Saripong for the short lymph node dissection. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Saripong Silicon Pimbun. I am a coronal surgeon from Rajawiti Hospital, Thailand. So my topic is lateral pelvic node dissection or LPND. First of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Art, to give me an honor invitation to join a big conference. 
The first reason, the prevalence of the colorectal cancer in Thailand in before COVID era is around 80,000 per year. In the past, we report and benefit outcome of new adjuvant CCRT in Thailand is a better disease-free survival in compare with the adjuvant CCRT. And I think our result is concordant with the international study in the local control effect of the new adjuvant CCRT. Recently, Another publication from Thailand show a benefit of the neurogenic CRT to achieve a 15% partial completion. When look in the number of hospital which able to give a radiotherapy, it looks sufficient in the number. But in 2020, from the resource book of Ministry of Public Health, they show a limit number of the radio oncologists in Thailand. And also they have a many workload to take care of another cancer with radiotherapy too. That's why our rectal cancer patients have a long queue to receive a radiotherapy. The second reason, the result of LPND in previous study, this is a meta-analysis compare TME alone plus TME with LPND. In the disease-free survival, in this testament, metastasis and in locally advanced, they show not different between TME and TME plus LPND. But if you notice in the red box, especially in local recurrence, they show a moderate of heterogeneity in the data because in the past, most of study did not tell us where is the location of local recurrence. The third reason is the nose after CCRT. This study show a high persistent lymph node after CCRT is around 35% and persistent lymph node is risk to have a lateral pelvic recurrence. And the last reason, the prevalence of lateral pelvic node involvement. In the past, it has a wide range from 8 to 30% to have a node in all locally at one rectal cancer. They have a many studies later to define the risk and the prevalence of the rectal cancer to have a lateral pelvic node. Until today, we have a significant number from this systemic review and it shows around 17% of rectal cancer have a lateral pelvic node involvement. Anyway, which patient have a risk to occur the lateral pelvic node involvement? Many studies try to define which patient need lateral pelvic node dissection, such as a sentinel node. But until today, it's still in the pilot. Recently report show us the patient with rectal cancer below the peritoneal infection and present of the lateral pelvic node with size more than 5 mm are least to have a lateral pelvic node involvement. So before I go on another topic, I would like to define a definition of lateral pelvic node. In the past or ordinary, it's defined the lateral pelvic node composed with the two areas, 
in the black and in the red triangle. But today, lateral pelvic node is only in the red triangle, no black triangle anymore. To define the boundary of the lateral pelvic node in the 3D model, you will see the lateral boundary is a iliac vessel, internal boundary is a ureter, and the caudal boundary is a pelvic floor or in low coccygeous muscle. And this is a landmark that I use when I perform a LPND. The first step, I will identify the ureter, dissect it out, and circle it with the vascular loop and retract it into the median. After that, I identify the iliac vessel and dissect around the common iliac vessel, go down further through into the internal iliac vessel. In this step, sometimes I encircle the internal iliac vessel with vascular loop or seals. After that, I enter into the obturator canal to identify the obturator nerve and identify the obturator vessel. So in this step, again, in some case, I need to control the obturator vessel to reduce the breathing during the dissection. After that, I enter the obturator canal, dissect out all the fatty tissue and go deep down into the paravisical area until I reach the pelvic floor. The laparoscopic view is maybe more clearer in the area that we want to dissect. In the green highlight area, this is the area that we want to dissect during perform the LPND. The step is, is the same because I start from the upward to downward from the iliac vessel go down to the pelvic floor. And this is a picture from the laparoscopic view. Today, maybe you can see in the opposite way from the anal side, such as from the TATME with LPND. This is a result to show us the significance of the lateral pelvic node when it presents of the involvement. This study performed in two hospitals to, in two continents and it shows in the same way significant better overall survival in absence of the lateral pelvic node involvement. And this study insists the significance of the lateral pelvic node with the relation of the lateral local recurrence at the hazard ratio 1.3. And this is the, my data in large with the hospital. I select only Patient underwent total pelvic excentration from 2012 to 2017, and all patients didn't have a neoadjuvant therapy before. In select only the LPND data in the five years survival, it shows significant in between three groups, state two. State 3 with LPND and state 3 without LPND in the green color. And also in local recurrent free survival, state 3 without LPND in the green color is worsened in compare between another two groups. In analysis, data only LPND show in the same way, 
the patient underwent LPND is better than without LPND in local recurrent free. In subgroup analysis, only have a no involvement in two states. It worsened in local recurrent free survival compared with the in one state. But in the metastasis, LPND in my data did not show significant relation of the metastasis free survival. And in my data, I didn't have a complication in sexual and urinary complication. You remember these slides about the persistent limb node and lateral pelvic recurrence. That means LPND still have a role after CCRT when it's persistent limb node. This study perform LPND after CCRT. The group A is a persistent limb node with LP with the node less than 5 mm perform TME alone. Group B node less than 5 mm underwent TME plus LPND and group C node size more than 5 mm underwent TME plus LPND. In the result about the oncologic result, the local recurrent free survival, disease free survival, and overall free survival, they show the group B is the best in all three aspects of oncology. And again, when subgroup analysis, only lateral pelvic node metastasis the presence of the lateral pelvic node involvement is worsened in all the aspects of oncology in compared to absence of the lateral pelvic node involvement. This is another study to show a relation of the LPND after CCRT and TME alone with the local recurrent when present of the limb node with size more than 7 mm. And this study to confirm the significance of the lateral pelvic node involvement after CCRT in 5-year overall survival and 5-year recurrent free survival, you can recognize when its absence is better than present of the lateral pelvic node involvement. And who need the LPND after CCRT? This paper is show relation of the limb node size more than 4 mm with a list of the metastasis. And this study show a list of the lateral pelvic recurrence and the persistence node with size more than 5 mm. Also, in this point, may I make a conclusion from the previous data for meta-analysis and these two study. May I make a conclusion? The patient have a persistent limb node after CCRT need to perform LPND if present the node with size more than 5 mm. And which regimen of the CCRT work with the LPND? In this study, did not show a significant in overall survival, recurrent free survival, and local recurrence in compare of short cord and long cord regimen. Anyway, when uh, we look in the complication data, maybe we can recognize the less complication in the long cost regimen. And also, when is the proper time to perform surgery after CCRT? We need to wait between the soft tissue 
in pelvis condition with the chance to get the postural completion late. So many studies didn't have a conclusion, but most studies suggest around 8 to 12 weeks after new adjuvant CCRT. And this is my last slide. May I make that conclusion? LPND is the one mode to regional control in locally advanced rectal cancer. And today, indication is the therapeutic indication when presence of the lateral pelvic lymph node size more than 5 mm. And lastly, we, if we need to perform LPND, please caution in the nerve preservation. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Um, that's uh, an excellent summary. And I apologize for all and our, our panelists for our various glitches we've had this morning. So uh, to respect everyone's time, uh, we're going to limit the questions to uh, the question, answer, and chat functions. So anyone from the audience um, or panelists who wish to ask questions of the panelists, let's do it through the box or, or the chat box which will then allow um, you know us to maintain the schedule as best we can okay so so the next speaker is a very famous speaker professor John Marks um, um, I've been I, I, I've, I've, I've met him many times and uh, attended his lectures many times as well it's been very impressive so uh, he's going to be speaking about uh, single port robotics today, Professor Mark. I would uh, like to thank everyone for the opportunity to uh, be speaking with you today, coming to you from uh, my hometown of Philadelphia. Uh, this is where I work at Lankinall Hospital outside of the city, and we're welcome to have any visitors uh, who come our way. Here are my disclosures. I'm happy to speak to everyone who speak with me. Hopefully, uh, it'll be a little nicer than some of the people. So, look, if we start to talk about um, where we are and uh, where we're going in minimally invasive surgery, I, I think that the things we would agree that we're all looking for are optimal visualization with ease of setup and dexterity and precision of movement, with good haptic feedback and range of motion, and the possibility of us doing this all uh, really through one small hole or no holes at all. You know, all the people here looking at things from a minimum invasive standpoint, we're used to having a pyramid of access with the hands and eyes on the outside of the abdomen, uh, looking in at the area of focus at the base of the pyramid. And so as we move to laparoscopic uh, single port surgery, what we saw was moving that triangle, that pyramid of access intra-abdominally. And what we were able to do this, but a lot of people reported significant challenges with orientation and clashing of instruments and the camera. So, you know, this quote about effectiveness of surgical operation being determined by the level of technical difficulty and therefore how many surgeons can perform the operation with a good clinical outcome, I think is very germane. So if an operation is so difficult, that few surgeons can perform it with good outcome. It's effective in certain hands, but has limited effectiveness in the wide world of surgical practice. Therefore, any technology which reduces the technical difficulty in the execution of an operation will automatically increase its effectiveness and therefore benefit patient care. And I'd suggest to you uh, that the SP robot offers us that. So for those of you who haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. Uh, the single port robot is housed in a two and a half centimeter cannula. There are four arms, uh, the, the 3D optics that we're used to, uh, which we're seeing here moving around. And then here you're seeing how it moves on the, uh, basically the C arm to move in and move things around and gives you the, the, the same robotic dexterity we're used to having, but this is uh, through this small hole. And so what we're doing and talking about this pyramid of access is taking this whole thing, this whole triangulation and moving it inside 
in the kind of the orb of the workspace inside the abdomen. So the robot is designed in anthropomorphic design. And so what you're seeing here, it has elbows and a wrist. So the elbows have to come in through the abdominal wall, through the port to come in uh, with a camera that you're showing here. And then the elbows come out. And then what we have is the ability to manipulate the wrists in the way that we're used to robotically. So, you know, I've had a big MIS experience and with single port surgery and TEM surgery, uh, I've done uh, a lot of these. And therefore, for me, it was very exciting to see this new technology bringing these things inside the abdominal cavity. And I know that some of the other speakers, uh, uh, Antonio and Steve also were out intuitive uh, together with me and a few others uh, years ago. And I had the good fortune of working with them to develop things uh, for colorectal surgery. And we started this on a uh, IRB approved approach in uh, October. And so, you know, these are the evolutions of technique uh, through multi-port to single port to XI to SP robot. And really, I think what we're talking about is using a change in access, but the procedure itself is the same. And what we're talking about is multiple modifications in order for us to be able to do things with the single port robot. So um, in any teaching of an operation, particularly an MIS procedure, we break things into productive versus non-productive activity. We've tried to standardize the approach to improve the efficiency of performing the operation. And so if we apply that thought process to um, what are we looking to do with the SP robot, uh, really we'd be talking about single port abdominal surgery, basically right and left totals and pouches as well, as well as transanal surgery, TAMIS, TEM, TATME, and maybe even some notes. And so what I'm gonna do is take you through a whirlwind tour of where we stand with all these things. So. You know, if, uh, you know, this is what uh, the single port looks like in the OR. We're using a gel port. We have an assistant uh, 12 millimeter port so we can uh, pass a stapler or um, sutures through. And these are the four channels, one of which is a little larger, which allows us to put in the, uh, the uh, camera. And this is how it uh, attaches. And what you notice is how simple this is uh, in, order of it, in order to attach this. It's uh, relatively quick and easy to move. And the camera goes in in this fashion. If you look up top, this circle here tells you when it's modulated properly. And then we're looking inside as we uh, move things around, see where we want to be uh, positioned. You can move your orientation circumferentially and then insert the, the, the camera. So I'm happy with that. So what I'm gonna do is just take you through a little bit, uh, some, and time's limited. So I'm just gonna show you a little uh, lips in terms of different operations. So first the left colon and the thought being, can we get better uh, visualization exposure with good outcomes? These are the nine steps of the operation. I'm just gonna show you a couple of them. And for me, when I was getting started with the single port robot, I was wondering, would it be strong enough and could we uh, do things clearly? So some of the limitations, which are clear limitations are that there is not a uh, stapler or a vessel sealer for the robot. So you're stuck with your assistant bringing in the uh, vessel sealer. And this is much the same situation that we saw at the beginning of the XI and the SI robot. However, what you do see is the ability to manipulate the tissue strongly, uh, see things very clearly, and have the dexterity to mobilize things. You know, this is showing the splenic flexure entirely mobilized. And then this is uh, showing us taking down the uh, IMA, I'm sorry, doing the, dissecting out the IMA and the IMV. And one thing to note, if you look down here at six o'clock, is this hologram. Uh, this shows you what your orientation is of all your instruments. And here we've dissected out the IMA clearly, and we're transecting this with a, 
uh, a ligature as we typically do. And we're taking the IMV uh, as well with the uh, ligature as we typically do. So, you know, if someone had uh, atherosclerotic disease, we put an endo tie on it, but typically not. And for those who are interested, we've published on this. Um, and, you know, our results have been, uh, we've been happy with them. You know, for the right colectomy, the same thing. Uh, what can we do? And, you know, I, I think there is definitely an ease of an intracorporeal anastomosis. And so this is um, kind of what we're looking at in this regard. Uh, and again, because of uh, difficulty with the time here, I'm just going to jump ahead uh, for us to see. Here we've put the two limbs, the small bowel and the uh, transverse colon next to each other for a side-to-side -side functional end-end anastomosis. You can again see the hologram down here showing us the orientation of everything. We're making our anerotomy and our colotomy. And then as Morris Franklin was fond of saying, uh, who really originated this intracorporeal right colectomy technique is it's like putting your legs within a pant. So you open this up, you have the ability with the robot to control everything, uh, the, the camera and your instrumentation, which I think we're trying to show here uh, is relatively simple to do. Uh, rotate that out. And then uh, once that's done, uh, we're checking the staple line, and then it's a matter of uh, starting to over sew the common channel. And uh, we're just showing this, bringing this all the way down and back uh, with a good result. So you certainly have the dexterity to do things. It's easy to tie and uh, uh, manipulate things I'm trying to show. And then this is what this patient looks like at the end of the operation. Um, and again, uh, we've been happy with our results with this. And for abdominal surgery, uh, these are some of the different incisions that we're seeing. And this is the size of a quarter. So you can see these are quite small uh, incisions. Then as we move transanally, looking at SP robotic uh, TAMIS or TEM, um, we're happy with the ability uh, to look at things and really uh, those of us with an experience doing a TEM and TAMIS, what you're looking for is a stable platform with uh, good optics and to have three arm manipulation and the ability to mobilize things allows us to see literally uh, with this amount of clarity, there's bipolar instruments and you have dexterity instrumentation. And so that really gives us the uh, Uh, the ability here to see the different um, layers of the rectal wall and decide if you want to do things submucosally or a full thickness fashion. You can also use the scissors. I like um, uh, the hook cautery here because there's less of a open issue. We have a more focused area uh, for your energy and you can see how nicely uh, this comes out. And again, is just showing how simple it is uh, to sew things. It's always a good idea when you're sewing endoluminally to bisect the defect. And then it's a relatively uh, simple matter to sew. And what I was trying to show with this and is in real time is the simplicity of using this is just what we're used to uh, robotically. And you know, we published our initial experience and we recently published in BCNR our, our initial 26 cases. And, um, you know, this is what we found. Generally, same thing as we did with TEM, about 20% of the time we're in the peritoneal cavity. And that's only because I'm very ex comfortable and experienced doing that. Early on, you'd want to not be that high. Uh, average number of dockings is only 1.7 and the average time to dock total only six and a half minutes. So in all these patients, we had no negative margins, no piecemeal extraction. So we were very happy with things. Uh, 
And while the uh, follow-up is short, it's been fine. So I think clearly at, once you have this in your hands, you'd want to do this. This would be your preferred method of doing endoluminal surgery. Uh, no question about it. Uh, what about TATME? Well, Antonio is going to be speaking about this as well, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I just thought I'd show you kind of visually what we're looking at. Here we are at the end of the TATME uh, dissection, entering into the perineal cavity. Again, uh, one can see the hologram, which is showing the orientation of everything. And I, I think this gives you, a pers you, you know, you can get the the impression of how strongly you can hold everything and move everything uh, around and finish uh, your dissection. Um, and this is just showing us with the completed TME uh, dissection uh, entirely from below. And um, here we are just uh, exteriorizing things transanally at the uh, con conclusion of things and then stepping the mesentery and doing a direct hand sewn colon on asthmosis. And I'm going to jump through this just out of uh, respect for everyone's time. And again, we published uh, our experience as well as some video demonstrations of this, if anyone's interested in looking at this in the literature. And then I guess the last question is, can we do this uh, with notes? And I would say to you, it's not exactly ready for prime time, uh, but we have some experience. Here we are coming in transanally. Um, we've identified the uh, left ureter. We are uh, coming uh, up and around over the aorta. We're underneath the mesentery here. So it's not exactly medial lateral. It's kind of inferior to superior, but it's in the same plane as you'd be medial lateral. We're coming up over the aorta, dissecting um, around. We found that you can see the hypogastric nerves there. And here we are. Again, a very good. Uh, Sorry about that, guys. Very good view of uh, the hologram and the position of the camera, as well as the retracting instrument and the two working instruments. And then this is showing how far we're coming through the anus. And again, we don't have a stapler and we don't have a vessel sealer. So what we're using here is Eclipse, which we do have. And uh, we're coming up over the uh, sacral promontory, uh, in the abdominal cavity, and then about to take the uh, IMA, which we're showing here. And uh, we're gonna double clip this because this is a long way away. And here we are just uh, cutting across the uh, IMA coming off the aorta. You can see that you have the nerves protected and you've got good control there. So in our first 100 cases, we've used this kind of as our experiences kind of in general. Um, in our first 50 cases, these were some of our results. Uh, no uh, conversions to open, um, low blood loss, and no mortalities or major morbidities. Uh, and over our first 100, we've had Again, no conversions are open and should be noted that less than 5% of these cases have any additional port uh, applied. I, we're gonna be presenting this at some of the spring meetings so we can't go too deep into it. Now, so in conclusion, I would say that um, the SP robot allows us beautiful, uh, the ability to do uh, surgery in an elegant fashion with excellent optics and three arm articulation. Uh, and it really gives us the ability to operate comfortably in a confined space that maybe isn't exactly the way with cells, even though we can do it. It's going to take a lot to get us there, but we should remember that we're certainly early in the game. And um, there are shortcomings, as said, the vessel sealer, suction, stapler are major shortcomings. Uh, but once this is in everyone's hands, I think everyone that will be excited to use it. Uh, I'd be remiss in ending without, without thanking uh, our excellent team at Lankinall. And thanks again, uh, Art and Steve, for the opportunity to, sp to speak here. And I look forward to visiting with you uh, someday to do this in person. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Uh
wonderful talk as always, impressive videos as always, and hopefully folks will have questions for you in the chat, because as I mentioned, we're unfortunately not going to have um, time for live questions. But let's go back to Delia, who I think is now ready, um, and John will let her share her screen. Um, thank you, Art, for this kind invitation. Um, Sabadika to all uh, surgeons from Thailand. And um, it's a great opportunity to can talk about the management of the advanced colorectal disease uh, and specifically about peritoneal metastasis and all the therapeutic options. Next slide, please. And thanks, Art. It's a, uh, it's a great honor to be in part of this panel. I guess that all of you as colorectal surgeons sometimes have face this situation, you begin the surgery and you find peritoneal metastasis. So I'm going to try to give you some tips, some indications about how to give the, our patients uh, the best option and the best survival. And the good news is that peritoneal metastasis of colorectal origin are no longer a fatal disease. Next slide, please. And it's true that without uh, any treatment, prognosis is really poor with a survival of around six uh, months. And but with palliative therapy, systemic chemotherapy and palliative surgery, survival is around 24 months. But now we have a treatment with curative intent, which is a combination of a cytoreductive surgery, hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy known as HIPEC and systemic chemotherapy. And the best reported ever overall survival with this treatment is around 64 months next. And we can even say that 16% uh, of our patients can be cured by this approach. Next. Uh, the most important, and I think this is one of the most important slides of the talk, is that a uh, cytoreductive surgery must be perfect. We cannot leave anything, any disease behind us at the end of cytoreductive surgery. What, that's why this type of surgery must be done by a specialized surgical oncologist. Because if at the end of the surgery, there is one remaining tumor nodule of 2.5 millimeters, survival decreases to the yellow line. And if there are more than one tumor nodule or one tumor nodule bigger than 2.5 millimeters, survival decreases to the gray line and there is no chance of cure for this patient. Next. And that's why cytoreductive surgery is by definition maximally invasive because we have to explore all the abdomen from up to down, looking for every single tiny tumor nodule. Next. Uh, we have to deal with very bulky disease. Next. Uh, we must do sometimes and block root sections, combining the uh, techniques of cytoreductive surgery, peritonectomy, and in block resections to achieve a R0 resection, or as we say, CZ0 resection next. And at the end of the surgery, we deliver the hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy by a procedure known as HIPEC. And uh, not only the surgeons, but as well the anesthetists, the ICU people, uh, our nurses, all the team must be trained uh, in this procedure next. So cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC is an option with curative intent for patients with a PCI or peritoneal cancer index of 16 or below 16 for patients with uh, colorectal cancer. And as we know, minimal laparoscopic uh, surgery and robotic surgery, but especially laparoscopic surgery is a gold standard for colorectal cancer. That's why we decided to move and to try to move to a minimal invasive approach in peritoneal disease as well. Next. And uh, one of the, this is one of the first descriptions uh, of, uh, of a video of a laparoscopic peritonectomy. Next. And we can do now a very uh, a complete laparoscopic peritonectomy from up to down, from both diaphragms to the pelvis. Next, please. And we can do extraction of the specimen through the um, natural orifice. Next, please. And this is a video, if you can make it work, please. So for example, for this patient, this is a patient with a right colon cancer and synchronous peritoneal metastasis. As you can see, there are several tumor nodules in the abdomen. We are proceeding now for the uh, peritonectomy. It's important to be very careful and to keep a certain distance uh, for from the tumor nodules. So we are beginning with the parietal peritonectomy. It's very important to keep uh, your dissection very uh, close to the peritoneum, avoiding to go into the retroperitoneal fat to prevent any um, 
bleeding. And as you can see, we are doing an in-block resection of the parietal, right parietal peritoneum with the right colon. We are proceeding now for the oncologic omentectomy, which is a crucial step of the uh, lab uh, surgery. And we are proceeding and we will do an M-block uh, left diaphragmatic peritonectomy with an splenectomy, because as you can see, there are several tumor nodules covering the spleen. We are going to, and here is the M-block uh, specimen. We are going to move now to the pelvis, which is one of the most uh, beautiful parts of the laparoscopic peritonectomy dissection. Um, we are accessing now the, the pelvis from the lateral part to the medial part. We have to create like a beautiful cone of uh, peritoneum. And we will do an in-block resection, as you will see, of the pelvic structures. Uh, as you can see here, we are proceeding now for the dissection of the uh, iliac vessels, the artery and vein. And we are keeping our dissection down, down, down. And you will find out how deep in the pelvis, you can see there the cone of peritoneum and how deep in the pelvis we are at the end of our dissection. And we are continuing our dissection in the lateral part. We have to identify and to preserve the ureter in both sides. As you can see, we are dissecting all the parietal peritoneum, and we have to continue our dissection until reaching the visceral peritoneum, because as you can see, there are multiple tumor nodules covering all this peritoneum. We will continue the dissection of the ureter, and we must do the uh, a salping, a bilateral salpingo of rectomy. We are going to remove the uterus as well because it's part of the pelvic peritonectomy. As you can see, we have an unblock specimen that we will remove, uh, remove through the vagina. And we have to complete the dissection of, uh, of the lymph nodes of the pelvis as well. So as you can see, we have opened the vagina. We are pulling up the bladder, urinary bladder. And next slide, please. Next. As you can see, this is the, the picture at, at the end of the, the laparoscopic uh, peritonectomy, which is exactly the same picture that you can get at the end of an open procedure with a complete lymph node dissection. Next. Uh, and next. And we can do exactly the same for the next, please. For the diaphragm, uh, we were uh, we described uh, for the first time the dissection of the um, diaphragmatic uh, peritoneum. We had described some, some tips uh, to do that, like the insertion of a chest tube before beginning the procedure with a positive suction. Otherwise, it's really complicated to achieve a complete resection because the diaphragm is all the time moving uh, back and forward. And with this uh, tip, it's very easy. You have to be very gently trying not to open the diaphragm that you can open it very easily. And you really want to prevent all the pneumoperitoneum from going into the test. Next, please. And it's important for all the groups who wants to begin uh, with this uh, laparoscopic approach. We always recommend to begin with patients with very low peritoneal cancer indexed. Next. Despite we are doing now a very advanced procedures, even by with the robot, and the most important is what if we are achieving an, a proper oncologic resection, and this is one of the most important publications from the international group of the laparoscopic peritonectomy procedures, and we are exactly replicating the same survival curves as we have with the open approach. So it seems we are moving in the right direction, and that we, we are guaranteeing. A, perfect oncologic uh, resection by the laparoscopic approach. Anyway, we always recommend the groups who are beginning with this. If you don't feel comfortable, if you think it can be any tumor, any tumor nodule behind, just convert to an open approach. Next. And this is, and now let's talk about uh, what type of chemotherapy deliver with the HIPEC, which is, as you know, controversial now uh, for colorectal cancer. And this is a, a photograph of all the uh, schemes of uh, HIPEC for colorectal cancer. Next. And as you can 
see this is completely uh, a mess. Next. So uh, it's very important, and I try to summarize here in this slide, uh, the main studies comparing mitomycin C and oxaliplatin, which are the two main protocols for uh, hybrid with colorectal cancer. And as you can see, there is no survival difference for oxaliplatin or mitomycin C, but there is an important difference and a statistically significant difference regarding um, morbidity and mortality, uh, which is really worse for um, all the oxaliplatin protocols. Next. That's why uh, there is an international recommendation from the SOGI group and from the RENAP group to perform HIPEC uh, for patients with colorectal cancer with mitomycin C. At, in the light of these results. And we are doing now, uh, cons uh, next, we are working now on a consensus, uh, a group of international experts. We are voting now through a Delphi process to get a consensus, not only uh, on the type of chemotherapy that we're going to deliver with HIPEC for colorectal patients, but also we are trying to define all together the next uh, research, the next trials and what is important uh, uh, for the hypec in colorectal cancer patient. Next. And another strategy to improve survival in our experiences, most of us, we have very long survivors. We have patients who we can get a cure for them, but not after only one cytoprotective surgery and hypec, but after repeated uh, procedures. Um, Many of us, we have very long survivors after two or three procedures, and these are the trials that demonstrate that it's really worth it to go for repeated PIPEC. As you can see, for patients undergoing iterative HIPEC, uh, we have a survival, a medium over survival, 17 months, almost one year and a half, superior to patients only undergoing one procedure and then palliative chemotherapy. Next. So uh, regarding uh, our approaches and minimally invasive approaches, it's feasible, and, but we have to move uh, to a consensus regarding the type of chemotherapy. And we are moving now, and our next research is will be again, um, above about uh, intraperitoneal targeted therapy or personalized HIPEC. Next. What about if you have a patient with uh, colorectal cancer in both peritoneal metastasis and liver metastasis? Well, in many hospitals, uh, for they consider this patient as palliative patients, but there is an option for them uh, to be treated as well with curative intent. It's true that uh, the criteria are more restrictive, and we are only treating patients in principle, with a PCI peritoneal cancer index below 11, and with three uh, liver metastases. It's true that now we are going a little farther, uh, but the most important is that uh, these patients must be, the disease in the liver must be chemosensitive. Next. Because all the published normograms show there is an important uh, advantage in survival when treating these patients uh, with a combined treatment with cytoreductive surgery and liver resection if the patient uh, presents a positive response to systemic chemotherapy. Next. And what about this patient? Next, it is a patient with, uh, as you can see, a complete involvement of the small bubble serosa. This patient is completely unresectable at any unit. It doesn't matter the PCI. What matters is the location, and the location makes the disease non-resectable. All the small bubble serosa is covered of tumor nodules. For, well, for these patients, we have another option, which is a minimal invasive option, which is PIPAC. PIPAC stands for pressurized intraperitoneal aerosol chemotherapy. Next. And it was born as a palliative next, and it was born, born as a palliative treatment, but now uh, only to relieve the abdominal symptoms because of the abdominal occupation by the tumor or to treat uh, a refract refractory ascites to systemic chemotherapy. But now it's treated in a new adjuvant setting uh, for patients with unresectable peritoneal metastasis with high PCI. That means PCI, um, which is more, uh, more than 16 for colorectal cancer and with chemoresistant tumors, even for patients with progression to systemic chemotherapy. Next. And this is how we do it. We only use two or three small incisions, two or three trocars, and we connect a, a high pressure angioinjector, which is uh, pushing the chemotherapy through a metallic trocar, which is called capnopen, which turns the liquid chemotherapy into aerosol chemotherapy next. With this, we can increase the penetration. Uh, this is a video. Can you please press uh, play, please? Uh, 
Uh, with this, we can increase uh, the penetration of the chemotherapy inside the tumor. Mm -hmm. And here you can see how the chemotherapy is very small uh, nodule and uh, just very small drops. Uh, next, this is like a snowstorm. Next, please. And this is how we usually uh, combine PIPAC with the systemic chemotherapy in the new adjuvant setting. The patient receives two cycles of systemic chemotherapy, then we perform one PIPAC, then two cycles of systemic chemotherapy, one PIPAC, and so far and so on. The idea is to perform a PIPAC procedure every six weeks. Next. And after that, we reevaluate the patient to see if the patient is already a candidate for cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC next. And what is the evidence um, uh, behind PIPEC? And this is one of the first uh, publication of the biggest um, uh, series uh, in the Lancet Oncology for the first 1,800 procedures. And as you can see, up to 86% of patients with colorectal peritoneal metastasis are resectable in palliative patients. They have a positive uh, clinical response when they are treated with PIPAC. And overall survival for them, it's, uh, it was at the time of this publication, is slightly superior now, uh, 16 months next, which is pretty impressive because we are talking about chemo-resistant patients. Um, the issue is we don't want to uh, follow this messy, uh, huge number of protocols of PIPAC protocols. That's why we have just published uh, three weeks ago this consensus uh, on the uh, consensus guidelines for pressurized interpretation laser chemotherapy, not only about the technical aspects, but we are trying to work all together with the same uh, protocols. That's why we're publishing evidence so fast regarding PIPAC because we are working all together with the same protocols and we have our international registry and all surgeons around the world are including uh, all the information about their PIPAC patients in the registry. Next. Um, this is my team in Saudi Arabia that we uh, we have been the only center doing PIPAC for the last two years. So we are treating a huge uh, number of patients. Next. And in conclusion, all patients with peritoneal metastasis should be referred to a hospital with a unit, a specialist unit on peritoneal surface malignancies because we have a treatment with creative intent for intent for all the patients. For patients with a PCI below cysteine, we can do cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. For patients with liver metastasis and, and peritoneal um, and peritoneal malignancies, we can do a combined treatment of peritoneectomy and liver resection and HIPEC. And for patients with unresectable disease or very high PCI we can do a PIPAC treatment. Next. Uh, next, please. And next. Next. And next. And next. Uh, so the most important Go back, please. <laughs> so the most important is that uh, all these uh, procedures, uh, laparoscopic peritonectomy and HIPEC, <clears throat> require a special training. And we have our SO course. Uh, next will be held in... Um, June in Alicante in Spain. So all of you are very welcome if you want to register to get training in that. And to can perform PIPAC, you must be, you require an accreditation by the International Society of Pera and Peritoneum. Next. This is the invitation for our European Society of Surgical Oncology hands-on course on laparoscopic uh, management of peritoneal metastasis. Next. And thank you very much, uh, Art. Um, uh, pa. And thank you very much for all the surgeons and all the friends who are part of my day-by-day uh, -day practice. And thank you very much. I am at your disposal next. If you have any question uh, regarding, or you have any uh, consultation regarding any of your future patients with uh, colorectal cancer and peritoneal metastasis, thanks. Excellent talk. Thank you very much. Glad we worked out the technical glitches. Um, Art, on to our next speaker. Yes, Ralph. The next speaker is just the uh, international, the renowned um, surgeons who uh, visited us in, in Thailand many times. And uh, we in Thailand and around the world would, would like to, to hear, hear from Professor Antonio Lacey of uh, what he's been uh, doing right now for TATME, the updates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Art. It's a real pleasure and honor 
to be with with you. Let me say, you know, there are two incredible chairs. One is my brother Steve. You know, probably my life would be would be different without him. And also, you, I remember your art because in a difficult days for me, you uh, are a real human being. And just let me say. You know, best regard to your family. My topic is about uh, TATME, and I think I can give you some uh, new things, probably new ideas. They are my disclosures, and I think it's important to start with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, sorry, with the uh, two important papers, randomized papers comparing uh, the. Uh, evidence between open and laparoscopic approach in, in rectal uh, tumors. And they are not, uh, they are uh, non-inflated trials and the, and the conclusion are, okay, laparoscopy could be worse. And the, re the, the reason is because probably laparoscopy is not ideal in terms of the, of the, of the, of the patients or maybe the quality of the resection. Maybe because the patient is sometimes, you know, 50 cents are male gender, there's a narrow pelvis, BMI is increasing every day, it's an epidemic uh, factor. The tumor, tumor size, previous radio chemotherapy, yes or not, the level of the of the of the tumor, where is the tumor? And I think it's very important also the um, the experience of the surgeon. In, uh, we performed the first uh, TATME with Pat Schiller in now in 2009 in the hospital clinic. Thanks again, I repeat several times the generosity of Pat Schiller came to the hospital. And we did more than 500 rectal resections for uh, this approach. In a summary, we have a uh, mean age 66, Gender is 43%, 56 male. Tumor local localization, majority in low and mid rectum, mostly T3. Neoadjuvant therapy, almost 70% of the cases. Interoperative complication, uh, not important complication, 8%. Operative time is very low, I think, is 140 minutes, is uh, a little more than two hours. Conversion rate is 8%. Postoperative complication, the majority in laparoscopy. Postoperative complication, we have the, probably the most important anastomotic leak is under 6%. I think it's important to improve uh, uh, because uh, there are theoretical benefits. It's improved surgical quality, improved long term oncological uh, outcomes low rate of dominant conversion and improve anastomosis and uh, to diminish the permanent stoma in our patients. Excuse me. Okay. There are many papers in, in literature since, um, let me say, 2010, 2015, saying, okay, this feasible is a very safe, they have good registry, many papers in favor to this uh, new approach. And I'm very happy because this uh, new approach is starting with a single team in the majority of cases, but now uh, since with our, uh, we described the Cecil approach, I remember a lecture in Bangkok, you know, one of the, of the, of the guys there was coming from Zimbabwe, I'm very happy, you know, remember the most beautiful lion in the world. And however, you know, recently we have a, uh, a very negative paper and Norway decided to suspend or to use the trans approach for rectal cancer patients. However, at the same time, there are many papers, or even we add our experience, they are in, in uh, that is uh, six centers in Netherlands, and it's all the results in the majority of, of the surgeries the same is related with the learning curve. 
if you uh, learn well, probably you do well things. And now we realize there are many technical problems in the Norway, uh, in the Norway uh, group because there are some problems to do the, the run in situ at the, at the beginning of the procedure, etc. And probably that was the, uh, the defect to have uh, not good results. Let me present our results comparing laparoscopy and transanal approach recently published. Our endpoint, the primary endpoint is three year local regional recurrence and secondary endpoints is histopathological outcomes, very important, systemic recurrence, this is pre-survival and overall survival. Patients coming from uh, Barcelona and from two hospitals in uh, Holland. We include stage two and three patients and only mid and low rectum, that means up to 12 centimeters from the uh, verge. The period of study is between 2000 and 2018. And a statistic, uh, we use a propensity score uh, study with a couple of Mayer Cox uh, uh, just to, to a sphincter preservation. We include uh, many patients. At the beginning, is uh, almost 900 patients. For different reasons, we exclude 153. We have 710, uh, 710 patients included in analysis, 366 in laparoscopy, 344 uh, underwent in trans TME. The median follow-up, as usual, because it's not a randomized trial, it's a professional score trial, is, uh, is lower in the TATME with near 28 months versus 61 in laparoscopic group. If you go to the, to the two groups, are quite similar. The only difference is the CRM positive is more important in the laparoscopic group and the quality of the mesorectum is very good. I, you know, I'm very happy because in the result of the laparoscopy group are very good because in the majority of cases, the quality of the total mesorectum station is under 80% in the majority of the studies. Rectal perforation, very important complication, is higher in the laparoscopy group compared with the other group. In three years local recurrence, we have better in the statistical point of view, uh, better results in the TATME is uh, under 4%, 3.6 versus 9.6% 9, 9, uh, in the laparoscopy group. In the three years, this is uh, free survival and the sphincter preservation patients are better also for uh, TATME. In three years, this is free survival. You have uh, not a statistical difference. However, it's a tendency because they are 74% in TATME versus 68% in laparoscopic group. And in three year overall survival is similar because it's 87 versus 82% in laparoscopic group. You have here the couple of major uh, curves with a very, I think it's a very encouraging uh, a study, you know, to continue to use and maybe to increase to use TATME in rectal approach. If you see this curve in favor to, uh, to TATME in the majority of the items is much better to use the TATME approach comparing with laparoscopy. In our conclusions, it's a multi-center cohort with more than 700 patients with rectal cancer stage two and three, and TATME, a three -year, uh, the three-year 60% risk reduction for laparoscopic recession comparing with, uh, for low, I'm um, sorry, for low rectal comparing for laparoscopic TME. In patients undergoing surgery with a sphincter preservation, the three years this is pre survival was higher in patients treated in the, in the TATM group. And the treatment of primary, uh, primary mid rectal cancer should include, is no doubt, the trans approach through this new approach. There are many uh, criticisms trying to say, okay, we are using you know, this uh, new approach, you probably have 
worse results in functional uh, outcome. And we uh, try to demonstrate that it's not true. If the endpoints is a primary is related with a, a quality of life validated with uh, different questionnaires in pre period three and 12 months later uh, the surgery. In the secondary, we use ultrasonography and manometry and rectal sensation testing. We include patients in the, in the hospital clinic with primary, anastom primary anastomosis with no stoma and not an asthmatic leak, we exclude those patients. And the uh, prospective study is from 2016, 2018, and we have the statistics. We have many different questionnaires, you know, probably the most important Wexner questionnaire and last questionnaire, and we use it and baseline in 100% of the cases uh, for many reasons in three months is almost 70%, 12 months, 12 months more than 71% of the cases. And endoanal ultrasonography in 82% and manometry in 75%. In our results, if you compare baseline with, uh, with three and 12 months, I think there are uh, good results due to the time, to the lack of time, probably going directly to these results. You know, we have uh, the old deterioration returned to baseline values uh, 12 months after surgery, like in many different approaches, even open laparoscopy or robotic. The exception is uh, you know, flatulence in some insomnia related with uh, constipation, and also 12 months you have uh, sexual interest in men increase in a comparing with uh, other uh, studies. In the, in, we have a good results, I think, in NL, uh, ultrasonography, but in some cases we do intensive the resection, and that's of course we have a, a, a functional sphincter more important in internal, not well. In the anal rectal manometries and rectal sensation texting, we decrease in anal uh, resting pressure and tenesmus in those patients, and maximum squeeze pressure and the squeeze duration remain uh, quite stable. In conclusion, patients undergoing this new approach reported acceptable quality of life and functional outcomes uh, one year after surgery and validation score were comparable to those conventional TME techniques, including open or laparoscopy or robotic, and uh, it still exists an impairment of the function. How, what about innovation? That is not really, in, really new. However, again, thanks to the recommendation of Professor Wegner, we started to use uh, the, the, the ICG and if you study in our cases, 320 cases, we have a leak at 8% of the cases, if not bad in the, in the rectal cancer. But if you use no ICG is 10%, and at the beginning of the, you know, with 64 patients, the, our leak rate was less than 2%. That is really important. And in many cases, we decided to change the level that we decided to do than estomosis. Again, it's thanks to my brother, Steve. Another important thing is when you have a leak, you know, it's very important to that diagnose as soon as possible and to use, for example, this uh, vacuum therapy that we have some, uh, res some uh, results and excellent results because the majority of them, you can use this new approach, this new technique to treat those patients and if this patient has a ileostomy, okay, we maintain the ileostomy, it's not, we clean and we do the ileostomy, and at the same time, we put the vacuum. And in the majority of cases, after uh, several uh, sessions of the uh, change in the sponge, you can close, you know, the defect with very, very good results, like uh, all the uh, paper published in literature. What about color three trial? Because you, we have the color one, color two, and now we have the color three comparing TATME with laparoscopy in rectal cancer, in low rectal cancer. You know, the, the, the number of patients has more than uh, 1,100, 
and now we have uh, until a week ago we have more than 600 604 and we include 42 patients because we our inclusion period was uh, started quite late because we don't have the permission at the hospital due to the very good results for TATME. Now we include 42 patients. And with this, probably we will have the real answer, what is the ideal case to use those, this treatment. When TATM comes to the rescue when other treatment had failed, probably is another indication when you affect the distal margin, it's a very, let me say, quite simple to do a re-resection and to do a re-anastomosis, not trying to, uh, not to make in an APR in those patients. And I think uh, that this solution is converted to trans approach, resect to rectal stump, and cecil approach was adopted simply and TA team was completed. And we have some cases even coming from other hospitals with very good results. Another important thing is uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, because sometimes when you do a two-step procedures, you did the uh, abdominal colectomy and you have to do the proctectomy in the, in the iliopouch anastomosis. Sometimes you have a quite complicated to the sidal level or even the inflammation in the second stage uh, to cre uh, before creating the ileal J pouch. Another good uh, uh, technique is the hammer reversal procedure. We started now uh, several years ago with excellent results. It's a very simple and very quick procedure. Another important thing is radiation proctitis. Fortunately, we don't have, as all the, uh, you know, in the previous uh, era of the surgery. However, we have in patients, you, you know, treated with uh, prostate cancer or GYN cancers. Another complex anal fistula, you can use this new approach with excellent results, trained to have better uh, results. If not, you can have uh, horrible. Even you can use, you know, with this approach, a stem cell. And I think it's an excellent lecture we, when we heard today from, uh, our, um, uh, from our Spanish colleague. And I think we can continue to work on it. However, we have to, to do something, is to educate people. You know, I think it's an extraordinary lecture, and I have envy of my friend John Marx with a new with a new robot. However, it's important to try to share other uh, knowledge and education. That is a creation with the, in trying to close in the gap. We're creating the AIS, you know, to close the digital exam between laparoscopy, between many people around the world. And now you have many different uh, technologies to have uh, better uh, knowledge of these uh, new approaches. Even we have a uh, uh, course related, you know, before coming to the hospital, more important in a pandemic situation like we have now. So it's not easy to travel. And I think it'd be important to do this. And now we are trying to do a new thing, you know, to try to do the same courses that we did in the past for, uh, but without traveling people. However, it's, I think it's important because I wanted to repeat, Da Vinci SP is so important. I don't have the opportunity to have in our hospital, but I will be very happy to use this kind of approaches because I'm absolutely convinced Robotic is uh, probably is another new step in terms of the laparoscopy and probably in the near future, everything will be uh, laparos robotic in the future or maybe combining SP or many things. At the same time, we can mentor, that is very important with the 5G. And you can imagine to have experts like Art, like Steve, like John, you know, with a superpower, it's like Superman, because we have the, you know, you have ubiquity to try to at the same time. It's not necessary to travel for John Marks when I have the opportunity to do the first SP TATME because we can connect, even he can control uh, my instruments from 
from a hospital. And we did it, we did it two years ago now, we continue to work, and I think TATME can be a good alternative to solve uh, cases in low rectum, even for me in high rectum, and online training and remote assistance is uh, the first case, could be the future with the new robotics. Thank you very much, Art, and I miss you, your family, and probably we can have something together. Thank you, very impressive. Thank you, excellent talk. Thanks, Antonio, fantastic talk, absolutely spectacular. As always, my brother, younger brother. Next, we go to one of our alumni from Cleveland Clinic, Florida, Professor Lucio in Brazil. And Lucia is going to end the last talk of the meeting, uh, giving us an update on sacral neuromodulation. Lucia is one of the, the world leaders in, in SNN, uh, not only in Latin America, but, but everywhere. Lucia. Hello, everyone. I would like first to thank uh, Dr. Iraniakas and Dr. Wexner for this kind invitation. I heard amazing talks. Everyone is um, need to be congratulated for this. And I hope we can meet each other uh, very soon on personally. So I'm gonna talk about the advances in sacral neuromodulation. And for this talk, uh, I have these disclosures. I'm proud to be speaker and proctor with Medtronic. You all know that sacral neuromodulation is now established a minimal invasive therapy, especially for those three indications, refractory, overactive bladder, non-obstructed urinary retention, and fecal incontinence with more than 302,000 patients implanted over a while. You know that also we have seen an increase in the number of patients with functional disorders with a great impact in the quality of life and also implication in health costs. And specifically, fecal incontinence is a prevalent and probably underestimated condition with comparable numbers when we look at other prevalent situations such as overactive bladder, diabetes, and so on. So since 1994, the initial publications, we have seen a change in the way we approach patients with fecal incontinence. The concept to stimulate a weak but intact anal sphincter has been replaced because it, was, it became clear that the mechanisms involved in neuromodulation explain the results for patients in other situations, such as when you have a gap or even if you have a low anterior section syndrome. So the first multicenter trial in USA demonstrated a significant reduction in incontinence episodes, as well an improvement in the quality of life. Also, uh, long-term follow-ups like in this study with 325 patients demonstrated a sustained efficacy in more than half of the patients with reasonable and acceptable morbidity. So in the last decade, sacral neuromodulation became really the first line therapy for fecal incontinence, regardless of the etiology, with strong recommendation by many important societies over the world. But how and why neuromodulation can improve different conditions with multiple etiologies? Well, the recent publications and ideas from Dr. Charles Knowles and his group in England have been an important uh, way to explain the new concepts on human continence. So they are bringing the idea that the subconscious reflexes in the rectum, not only the rectal inhibitory reflex, but also the rectal anal recitatory and rectal uh, contractor, those reflexes provide a fine balance between the different phases of defecation. Also, the sigmoid column has a motility that participates controlling the rectal feeling. The cyclic motor pattern can be initiated by sacral neuromodulation, which may also help to explain in part symptomatic improvement in patients with fecal incontinence undergoing neuromodulation, specifically in those with an anal sphincter defect. If you look at this figure and remember the bladder control, you can see that both mechanisms are very similar. 
And this may account for the shared utility of neuromodulation, which currently considered the gold standard procedure for both situations, OAB and fecal incontinence. We know that as part of the mechanism, neuromodulation can change rectal sensitivity, leading to a better coordination between the rectum and the sphincter muscles, also modulation of the C fibers with inhibition of the sacral reflexes, all that regulates the rectal contractility. The Furthermore, uh, this therapy restores the balancing between the excitatory and inhibitory reflexes, improves the afferent transmission of the pudendal pathways, restores the brain activity, and also provides neuroplasticity. The evolution of the therapy was crucial to, the, to its development, creating a minimal invasive technique with less aggressive and more safe for the patients. The evolution also came with reduction of the size of the generators. An improvement in the technique of lead placement was attempted with the use of new imaging modalities, such as the portable CT scanner. We slowly changed the way we used to mark the anatomical points, and we now simplify the technique using the lateral view to find the third foramen. Certainly, the adequate technique is crucial for a successful implant, allowing the adequate placement of the time lead very parallel, improving the contact with the target nerve. And this is possible when the lead is placed in the cranial medial aspect of the foramen. This was well demonstrated in this paper. Avoiding situations like this, the lead is completely out of the correct place. What about the novelties in neuromodulation? I had the privilege to participate in this last update of the ICS chapter on surgical uh, treatment of fecal incontinence. And after a broad revision of all techniques and devices we have nowadays to treat fecal incontinence, uh, we came up with the revised algorithm and you can see that neuromodulation is uh, replacing many of the techniques. And I have to say that stem cells as presented by the previous speaker also has a place in this algorithm in the future perhaps. But to be competitive with other similar devices such as, such as the one of the Axonics company, a new generator was recently launched even is smaller, and with the novelty of being rechargeable and with an increase in the battery lifespan for 15 years. In addition, the new generator is compatible with MRI, which for us colorectal surgeons is very important because we have a percentage of our patients after resection that develop some functional disorders. So a new generation of controllers for the doctors and the patients are now available and the devices are controlled by Bluetooth technology uh, being much smaller and similar to the smartphones. The rechargeable devices can be easily recharged with less than one hour and 20 minutes. However, this generation of stimulators have brought new situations that were well covered in this recent paper. We need to select patients that will fit well to a rechargeable device, as the rechargers are more challenging in obese patients and in individuals with problems of cognition and dexterity. So also there is a trend of uh, recharge-free devices preferences among patients because they don't want to be constantly reminded that they have this condition. So now neuromodulation has certainly many advantages over other therapies as I presented in the beginning. It is a therapy that affects various physiological functions. It is reversible and minimally invasive. And most importantly, it is the only technique that allows us to do a test. A positive test is an excellent predictor of success. So in 2019, in one of my presentations, I was considering to use PTNS to select patients. We were expecting modern and smaller generators with 
longer battery lifespan. We also realized that we would need to improve awareness regarding incontinence within the doctors and to create a strategic plan for helping more patients. So what happened in just two years? Well, we realized that the test is really the only positive uh, predictor of success. Now we have smaller generators. We, all have, we already have this, that, and we have generators with an increased lifespan. But what we still need to improve, we still need to uh, um, create an awareness uh, regarding incontinence uh, around uh, the world. Uh, we need to plan these strategic plans for, for helping more patients. And also we need to reduce the cost of the therapy. So nevertheless, we learned that uh, saconeuromodulation can be clinically effective in patients with fecal incontinence including sphincter defects. It can be an option for the low anterior resection syndrome and even an alternative for patients with colonic inertia. So in conclusion, neuromodulation has changed the way we build our algorithms for fecal incontinence, especially because we understand now better the mechanisms to explain the role of rectal sensorimotor functions, neural reflexes, and central nervous system control. The recent advances in the therapy will certainly help patients to be treated and to improve quality of life. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to see all of you. And I hope we can meet each other in the future next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucia. Outstanding lecture. Uh, thanks to all of the speakers for, for your time and your expertise. Fantastic uh, presentations today. I'm sorry we didn't have time for discussion, um, but uh, there's been some online chat. It seems that the questions that were posed uh, were indeed answered. Uh, and I know some of our panelists had to leave to do other things, uh, but those of you still with us, wonderful. Thank you, all. I think we're all looking forward uh, unanimously to visiting you in Thailand in uh, person, um, hopefully in 2022 or the latest 2023. So thanks for your hospitality. Thanks to the technical crew uh, at Bangkok Hospital Phuket. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. Close. Thank you. Thank, thanks, everybody. Thank you for all your times and clips and looking forward to welcoming you to Phuket in person, hopefully next year, Prof and everybody. Hopefully this time next year. <laughs> okay, so uh, Good. thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, healthy, happy holidays to everybody. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Art, right. you are the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. We'll see you at you all soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank see you. Everyone. Hey Art, great job. And it's hard in these times. Congratulations <laughs> on having the food to make it happen. You know, it's it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, from thank you. Thank you. And and yeah, I really hope to to welcome you to Phuket. I, I remember. Once uh, I was I was trained in, in Florida. You 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 were with me when 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 I was presenting my my research back then in back in two thousand and nine. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Thank you. And and I have a, uh, a I've always I, I went I went to Kosamui once. Oh, really. In, uh, in 1989, the, the week after they had opened oh. the airport to go to Mui. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to get back there. So I look forward to being with you sometime. Definitely. It's more beautiful nowadays. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. Have a good night. Bye -bye. You, you, you have a good day. Bye bye. <laughs>